Lawrence, do you want to introduce yourself or do you want to let Elliot introduce himself uh, and we'll just get to know him? Yeah, so um, we're here with uh, Elliot. Um, actually, you know, uh, Charles, you go ahead and leave that up and I'll go ahead and look at stuff in the background. Oh, okay, so I'm talking. Yeah, okay. go ahead and talk, yeah. Yeah, hey, Elliot. So it looks like, you know, uh, why don't you tell us a little about your background? I guess you're more of a software guy or you're like a trader quant type of guy or how do you get into this world? Well, okay, so I was... Uh, can you hear Elliot, Charles? Yeah, I, I can hear him. Oh. oh, can you not hear me, Lawrence? Why don't you continue, Elliot? Do you, you can hear me. If he can't hear me, do you Oh, sorry. I, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Was your was your audio like turned off? <laughs> something something happened. I, I think a ghost came and turned off my audio. <laughs> I think that's right. my story. Let me know if I go out. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm more of a software guy. I always have been. And then it wasn't until 2008 when the crash happened that I got really really interested in finance. And so basically, I was working at Microsoft at the time, and I quit. Um, did a spat at a hedge fund and now I'm working at LA wave international, um, building, uh, LA wave automation software. Um, but my interest in Bitcoin was basically, it was just the perfect intersection of being interested in software, being interested in finance. And also I was very interested in the Liberty movement and it was kind of, I guess, a trifecta of those three things together. So it became a really big, you know, interest of mine. Okay, so uh, today, are you actively uh, engaged uh, in cryptocurrency, or how did you get into this? Okay. Yeah, not so much anymore. Um, I mean, I was we were writing about it early on. Uh, we put out a publication at LA Wave International to all, to all of our subscribers, which just so you know, it's a financial newsletter, so we call markets and recommend investments, that kind of thing. Um, and so we recommended Bitcoin. That was in September 2010. Um, and we did it mainly for fundamental reasons because, you know, it couldn't be inflated. It was a hard currency. It was decentralized. So it just had a lot of really cool properties that made it uh, fascinating. And then basically we've been tracking it since that time. And we started putting out warnings. Um, we put out an article on uh, CNBC in uh, July uh, I guess it was around $3,500 kicking around there. And then when it hit around 20,000, we had another article coming out, basically warning about the psychology around Bitcoin and how it reached just kind of extreme proportions. So now we're kind of calling for a very large bear market period. So I would say I was very interested when it was cheap and I would say today I am not really interested in it at all, at least not from an investment point of view. Uh, I've kind of moved on and, and, and gotten out of it completely. Interesting. Yeah, so th yeah that's very interesting. Uh, but before we get into all of that, you know, I'm going to ask the, the newbie question. So your name is Elias. And you work for a company called Elliot Waves. Is there any connection to that or no? Yeah, there's a connection there. My, uh, my dad started the company in 1979, and uh, so he's been following the markets for a long time. I guess his claim to fame was in the 80s. He was calling for a historic bull market followed by a historic bear market. We've had the historic bull market, and uh, we, we haven't had the historic bear quite yet. We think that's coming. But um, so, yeah, I joined here after getting interested, but it wasn't, like I said, until that crash period that I got the interest, and until then I just – I never paid attention to anything financial really before that, but it was just so exciting in 08 because so many people were, you know, it, it affected a lot of people. Obviously it was a really big deal, but also it was interesting to be on the other side of that and to kind of understand what was going on. And for me, it was exciting being in the bearish camp because it was like, you know, it made sense when most people around me were confused. I was like, okay, I have an understanding of what's actually going on here. So it wasn't, mm -hmm. a, it wasn't a surprise when that happened, I guess. Got you. So let's dig deeper into that then. So you work for Elliott Waves and you guys have a, you said financial newsletter, is that right? 
Yeah, we've we've got several. There's the theorist and the financial forecast. Um, that's those are probably the main ones. There's a lot of other, but other ones, but those are the kind of the main ones. Got you. So um, let's talk about, I guess, how do you go about uh, evaluating fundamentals from your perspective when it comes to, I guess, the crypto market? So like, what are the things that you look for, you know, for good investments? I don't know. There, there's so much I could say about crypto. Like, like I said, when I first discovered it, it was, it was a little bit like, I guess, gold money or uh, li the Liberty dollar or e-gold. I don't know if you've heard of those kinds of companies where, they wanted to create an alternative currency that, you know, couldn't be inflated and was, was somewhat outside of the mainstream uh, set of national currencies. And um, Bitcoin, I think, was the first time anyone had ever done it where it couldn't really be shut down because most of these other organizations had been. So I think based on that was the main thing I looked at and said, there's a niche for this, you know, for having something that doesn't require trust. There's going to be a lot of use, use cases for it. So it was really purely fundamental in the beginning. Um, but in terms of why we, why my opinion switched on that towards more of a bearish opinion, it's twofold. I mean, there's, there's a fundamental side of it I could get into about limitations uh, that the blockchain technology has, at least in its current incarnation. These are not unsolvable problems. But I think, I think the main reason I changed my mind on it was the psychology of, of investors. Um, you can just look at, like I think uh, a few months ago there was a guy who sold his house, sold all of his belongings, and his family and him are living in a tent out in the woods, and they put everything they had into Bitcoin. And this was, I think, two months from the all-time high, or maybe a month and a half. And you know, these are just not the normal kinds of things you read when something is a really good time to buy. It's usually something you usually read this stuff when something has been significantly overbought um, and a lot of people who got too excited are due to you know unload their positions so i think it's it's there's a fundamental side which if you want to explore more i could get into that but but the number one thing i'm looking at is the the technical uh, or psychological side i guess of it yeah let's have and this conversation um yeah you know on our end you know i don't want to say we know everything but we know a few things about you know technical analysis, fundamental analysis, the blockchain, yeah. market sentiment, and all those sorts of things. So I think that would be a fascinating discussion. So I guess, you know, to preface this, let's, let's put things into stride. So now there is uh, the application of the blockchain, which is known as Bitcoin. Then there is the rest of the world of altcoins. Uh, first, the call it currency knockoffs from say, you know, Litecoin to then some maybe privacy coins like Dash or Monero to maybe other uh, implementations such as Vertcoin, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then you have the whole blockchain world and altcoin world um, of, you know, that starts with, you know, Ethereum and, you know, goes on from there. So uh, in order to keep things focused, uh, do we just want to focus and talk more on the currency application or do we want to expand uh, into the blockchain, or, or maybe we start with one. Uh, do you have a preference in which, you, which you'd like to pick? Oh, for me, I mean, I think the two are actually, actually quite separate. I, I per, and this is my personal opinion is I view blockchain as an implementation detail of a, an alternative currency or a cryptocurrency. I think there, it's possible there are other ways that Bitcoin could be designed. Um, Peter Todd is one of the X developers of Bitcoin Core that I follow a lot has been talking about this new concept called tree chains, which could be much more scalable than what we use, what blockchains, um, than how blockchains function. So to me, they're not exactly the same thing. So I'm personally more interested in the currency applications than I am in saying, okay, let's use this concept of a untamperable database and apply it to medical records. I mean, I, I've seen people out there take blockchain to all kinds of crazy places that to me, it's not readily apparent what the usage is, is there, or the killer app is there. And th there probably are some, it's just they haven't actually been proven out yet, I suppose. It seems to be a lot of hype and a lot of possibilities. Okay, so this is actually, I think, an interesting uh, philosophical uh, discussion. You know, you being a technical person and working at a financial uh, research organization. I guess, you know, 
the first question I would ask is, you know, today blockchain slash Bitcoin, is it just an applicant? Is it just, you know, a fad or are we in an internet? Are we in the equivalent of 1995 where, you know, the only thing people really know is this concept called email and, you know, the web, like, you know, I don't know if I could ever use this internet stuff to go buy airline tickets or, you know, video conference or, right. Right. you know, order food online or geez, buy clothes online or buy a book online. Do you see what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I think that's a critical juncture side. So I guess I'm curious to get your opinion. Um, it appears, you know, from my perspective, you know, we are well into this, call it information age. And more and more, uh, the problem with the information age is there's just too much information. So then to solve that problem, there's, we've come up with this concept of trusted entities from, you know, you know, obviously in the currency application, the trusted entity is, uh, you know, the government. Um, but outside of the currency applications, there's other trusted entities. And, you know, as we look at this latest, uh, you know, the news cycle regarding Facebook, you know, is it really a good idea to trust uh, in these large entities that might use, whether it's data stores or other things, um, you know, for their own purposes, right? Does absolute power corrupt absolutely? Then when you talk about trust and decentralized trust, there are applications. I think a lot of them are in the more supply chain uh, side of the equation where a uh, blockchain type uh, distributed ledger ecosystem, you know, may actually be pretty uh, beneficial. You know, ideas range from uh, food safety, uh, traceability applications to maybe decentralized uh, identity management applications, you know, so forth, so forth, and so forth. So I guess from your perspective as, you know, I don't know if you look at this as an investor or let, let, let's start. Do you look at this? Are you looking at this just as a technologist? Are you looking at this as an investor? You know, I mean, and what is your role within Elliott Wave, right? Because right. if you guys are financial research, I mean, I, 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 I'm not intimately familiar with your organization, but when you say financial research, I think, okay, you're maybe like a Motley Fool or an Agora Financial or a sure. or something, you know, on yeah. that front. Yeah, you've asked a lot of different questions here. Let me back up. I, I guess one of the questions you asked was about whether blockchain is a fad or whether it's something that I don't know, has more applications that we'll keep seeing. Um, so I want to distinguish the, the technology from the investment because I think they're not the same thing. And when I first started talking, I was talking about the investment angle, which I think is you know very important as well because to me that involves this you know, the psychology of people and how they're perceiving blockchain technology, which is not the same thing as what people are actually using it for. And again, I want to separate myself from blockchain a little bit and say maybe cryptocurrency technology in general, however the ledger functions. I think that definitely has a huge future. Um, the other blockchain applications, I don't know enough to comment on. Um, I would say that decentralization in general is expensive and, and difficult. Centralization is just cheaper. So if you have multiple competing firms that are centralized, um, that's probably going to be cheaper than a single decentralized solution. Um, because, um, I mean, just just by just look at Bitcoin, you know, the, the copies of the blockchain and then all the miners, and, you know, it's a large industry. It, with if you had ultimate trust, you could just have a couple servers with one company tracking who owns what. It would be a lot less expensive. But we all know why you can't do that because they would just create however much currency they want for themselves. So, you know, there are cases, and I think currency is a killer case where decentralization makes a lot of sense. Uh, but for other areas, you know, like I said, I've I'll, I'll maybe uh, let you comment more on that because I haven't I haven't studied a lot of the business applications outside of currency. So I'm more I'm more interested, I guess, in the cryptocurrency side of things than I am on the other applications. That's fine, um, and, and let's let's stay where you're comfortable because you know definitely oh, sure. don't, you know put you. But, on the spot. you know, I I see both sides of this because I think there's a lot of people who in the early days of Bitcoin 
basically just thought it was kind of silly or ridiculous. And a lot of those people are still saying that now. So they've been bears the whole time. Or the opposite, people who are technologists and they're very enthusiastic and they're still just as enthusiastic now. So I kind of want to play the role where, where, I can, where I can point to both sides of this. And uh, as far as Bitcoin goes, I kind of look at it a lot like the internet in 2000 or RCA in the 19, late 1920s. I mean, there are all these revolutionary technologies that went on. And, and, and real quick, what's our, what do you mean by RCA? I, I'm not sure of what that term is. Oh, just electronics company. I'm talking about like electronics. Oh, oh okay. The, uh, 1940s and 50s and then, you know, computers uh, and the, well, the internet, I should say, after the 2000s. Obviously, um, these were huge things that went on to have bright futures, but it doesn't mean that they didn't experience uh, overblown valuations and a very, you know, dark period prior to that, you know, and I think that's, that's pretty much the way I'm looking at Bitcoin um, right now. So the technology side of it, I think it has a great future. The idea has a great future. Um, but it doesn't mean that right now it's not psychologically a little overblown in people's minds. I mean, we don't even know if Bitcoin is going to be you know, a huge uh, part of our lives in the future, whether it'll be another altcoin or what. So it's just, it's a lot of speculation, I think. And, and I think a lot of people are a little too gung-ho. There's a little too much belief and not enough sitting back and really thinking about, um, thinking about what's going on, I think. So, 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 so let's, let's look at, you know, specifically the application of currency. Um, yeah. It is an interesting application. Uh, in my case, I am very bullish on blockchain as a technology. Yeah. I'm conflicted, but willing to take a bullish bet on Bitcoin as an application because I see a potential for an asymmetric gain. That's just where my head's at. But I think it would be good to talk this over, you know, and I would love to get your perspective on this because, you know, there's a lot of possibilities that can go wrong. So, uh, I will uh, first, you know, since you're more of a bear and that's fine, I will uh, take a more bullish stance on Bitcoin and let's just kind of talk it through. I, I think it'd be kind of fun. Does that sound like a plan, Elliot? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So the concept of uh, Bitcoin or uh, an alternative currency lies in the fact that currently the uh, primary, uh, call it world ledger, or, you know, most of the world today is tethered to the US dollar. That's kind of the reality of the situation. The two concepts that have been thrown out uh, for, um, you know, Bitcoin, one is that is a new type of uh, reserve uh, that everyone can tether to. And that solves uh, certain problems out there because, you know, uh, you know, and this now might become a little more macro, but, you know, people might say, well, you know, the U.S. as a superpower is kind of, you know, seen its day, you know, maybe it's 50 or 100 years from now, hard to say. Um, the lack of trust in the U.S. in terms of monetary policy is relatively high. Um, you know, like there's a variety of reasons. So, you know, there are people that say that, hey, having a decentralized standard that we can all sit on uh, is a good thing. And basically, what options do we have if we we're going to go down that route? There's the option of gold. Uh, and there's the uh, option now, a new option of uh, Bitcoin. Now, in yeah. addition to that, there is a secondary, uh, like if we want to get more theoretical, there's the side saying, well, traditionally the market of gold, uh, gold has been our store of value. That's been kind of the reserve. And if you, you know, chart out the history of gold, you know, gold has stayed relatively similar in, you know, value, which again is such a relative term, but, you know, if you look at it, the wages that a Roman centurion was paid, you know, 2000 years ago is still in line with what like an army captain makes today in terms of US dollars and stuff like that. And you know, if you look at like that gold wage and things like that. So 
Is gold uh, a standard? Is Bitcoin a digital gold? And then, you know, if we really want to get fanciful, we say, well, what if only, you know, out of, you know, for diversification purposes, 10% of the value stored in gold, you know, went into Bitcoin. And now we have a market cap of what, probably almost, you know, a trillion dollars or something like that, you know, give or take a few billion, you know, on that front. So that is, those are two examples of uh, bullish indicators um, for Bitcoin. Um, curious to get your opinions um, on that. Yeah, the, the gold thing is interesting because that's been a common complaint that some people have had about Bitcoin. They're saying, well, it's not backed by a hard currency like gold, something physical, something I can touch. But I've never really agreed with that sentiment. Um, but I think that's been a big dividing line between people who are interested in, in hard or non-inflatable, I should say, currency who were, who would be big gold bugs, but wouldn't support Bitcoin. So it, it's been a, it's amazingly small percentage of people who really got Bitcoin, I think in the early days, because it's not so much whether you can touch it or not, it's what its properties are. And if you look at the properties of Bitcoin, the properties of gold, they have a lot of things in common. Um, one of those things is that it's difficult to counterfeit or inflate. Um, you could actually argue Bitcoin is even harder to counterfeit than gold because even gold today, they can synthesize small amounts of it in a laboratory setting. And obviously there's still miners that are digging more of it out of the ground. Um, but with Bitcoin, you know, there's really no way to do that. There's 21 million coins and, and that's kind of it. So I think that's a really good point, but there are other things that that you can do with like if you just look at Monero as a good example has better privacy than Bitcoin uh, there's Ripple which has better scalability and can transfer other assets but it's not really decentralized um, and if you just look around at all the different currencies there's they all have kind of different pros and cons but I think this is a really good thing because what we're seeing with these currencies it's it's the emergence of competitive free market money is the way that I look at it so you know, it's, it's, it's fun and I've had this discussion with people about which currencies they like, which ones they don't like and why. And at, at some level, I also look at it as, do you like the chocolate ice cream or the strawberry ice cream? Because the beauty of it is that there is choice and there is that free market of money. So I think by virtue of this, these competing currencies existing is, is very, very nice. And it's going to up the quality, I think, of currencies all around the world. Um, in fact, I saw an interview not too long ago with one of the founders of PayPal, and he was saying, he was talking about the, just the fact that it's easy to transact between national currencies today has actually kept national currencies more stable than they have been in past periods where it wasn't as easy to transact, aside from what was gold backed, which, which is another story. But so, you know, on that sense, we're definitely in agreement. Um, I guess, though, I wouldn't call myself a Bitcoin maximalist, per se, where I say, well, that one will be the future currency for sure. So, But I'm more in the camp of this private currency is a great idea. I'm not sure which is going to, quote unquote, win. But I think the things that Bitcoin has going for it, the number one thing is just that it has the most number of people involved in it, highest market cap, most people invested in it. And it was the first mover. So a lot like, you know, the Linux kernel, for example, it can evolve hugely over time. Uh, the technology could be completely different for it, but as long as it has that momentum behind it, it definitely could be a winner. So I, you know, long-term, we probably have more in common than you think. I mean, I'm actually very bullish on cryptocurrency in the very long term. My bearishness is more over a three to four year time frame. Um, basically, I'm not saying we're going to zero, it's the end, but I think a lot of stuff is going to move lower for mainly for psychological reasons. The one I, the thing I always point to to justify that, one of my, my favorite things to look at is uh, Dogecoin, um, which if you haven't heard of it, is where someone took, you already know what I'm talking about, took a oh, copy yeah, of yeah. Dogecoin with I, a dog on it. And it's yeah. like, who, who's justifying the valuations on something like that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you on that. I, I would think, um, you know, there's definitely a flight towards quality. Um, we are in a market that's been oversaturated, but that was no different than, you know, 96 or 98, where you had, you know, everything.com. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. On that front. So I guess, 
So if I yeah, understand you Google, you can have the crash and then still have Google is the way I look at this. So even though okay. things are frothy now, it doesn't, it's not long-term bearish. It's, it's, but it may be bearish for a little bit. That, that's the point I'm trying I, I, to make. I guess let's, let's bring frothiness into perspective, right? So um, you're saying that the bubbles happened and we're now in this, you know, massive trough of disillusionment. So if you were to put this against call it the tech dot com boom. Would you say we're yeah. in 2001 right now after this recent 70% drop? Uh, or are we in maybe like a 96 or a 93? Yeah. when there were also, you know, pretty sizable drops on that front. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. I mean, the main thing I'm, when I'm looking at this market is the volatility, first of all, is incredibly high in both directions. So a 70% move in Bitcoin is actually not really a big deal. Um, volatility, um, if, you, if you look at two different markets, the volatility throughout time, you have to kind of normalize for that, if that makes sense. So a 70% move in the NASDAQ would be a really huge deal relative to its historical performance. So for Bitcoin, you know, if it were to bottom, if, if we've already bottomed and it's moving higher, then this wouldn't look like much of anything in terms of Bitcoin's longer term history. But no, and this is where we get into more technical analysis, um, which I don't really want to get into too much at this point. But uh, what we're looking for in terms of the size of the pullback is a little bit larger than the other pullbacks we've seen in Bitcoin. Um, so personally, I'm looking for it to go below triple digits somewhere around there before we reach a point where we might say, okay, psychology has reversed enough where we might be able to start a new uh, bull phase. Now, I'm curious about the psychological aspect because um, what I've noticed is this market, specifically the crypto market, is very different than your traditional investing market, particularly due to the fact that the vast majority of capital is uh, consumer-driven capital versus um, institutional capital. Um, you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I... I don't think it's, I guess I haven't noticed any large differences other than the volatility in terms of how it trades. Certainly the, you know, the, the patterns we look for technically seem to be just the same in Bitcoin as any other asset. Um, if anything, they seem to be more clear in Bitcoin because we really, everything we do here at Elliott Wave is based on psychology ultimately. And the more certainty you have with an asset, the less you have, herding behavior and psychology play a part. And the less certainty you have, the more you have that. So Bitcoin is really very cool because it has so much uncertainty around it. And everybody's kind of guessing that it actually, um, you get to see these psychological patterns much more clearly than you do in other assets. And we see that even in the stock market. When the stock market is going up, it tends to be not quite as clear. And then when we have a bear market, things get very, very clear. From, from our point of view, because that's when psychology takes over and people are not certain of what's happening and uncertainty almost always um, correlates with uh, increased predictability, at least you know, with, with our approach. So uh, let's talk about how you actually uh, analyze. Um, are you looking at market sentiment? I mean, what is the barometer that you're using to determine uh, the lack of uh, consumer confidence essentially um, in this asset or an asset in, in, in this digital asset in Bitcoin you, you're talking about in particular or the whole uh, altcoin mania let's stick with Bitcoin uh, because when you get into altcoins you, it gets really messy so let, let's look at Bitcoin you know you you're bearish on Bitcoin correct yes yeah definitely so what are the factors the that next make you years at least so, okay, yeah, for the next couple of years, you're bearish on Bitcoin. Uh, that runs counter to what, you know, perhaps John McAfee might say. Uh, but, yeah. You know. Well, he's one of the extreme examples. We've actually, we, we published a book not too long ago called The Mania Chronicles, where we go through history and study all the largest manias. And we look at the profile of what people were saying at different stages throughout that, that cycle to try to figure out where we are in it. And it's really cool actually watching Bitcoin and 
um, we just made a chart and we have all these quotes of what was going on in terms of news and headlines and what people were doing. And there's things that happen in different stages. You know, when Bitcoin was six cents, nobody cared about it. Nobody talked about it. Um, it was really treated as kind of a joke. And that's exactly the way it has to be treated because if people took it seriously, it wouldn't be at six cents. So it's kind of like, it's axiomatic that the psychology would be like that when it was very cheap. And of course, that's when we were we were recommending it to people. Um, but when the price starts reaching its final stages of this cycle, you get some uh, some patterns that are that tend to be similar to past manias. And some of those things you you see are projections. Uh, that's a very common thing where you read over and over. Um, usually, noteworthy people calling for the price to reach crazy extremes. It's like in two thousand, we saw calls for. Dow 100,000, things like that. And we've got a tons of projections on Bitcoin, people calling it to go to a million dollars or uh, replacing the dollar, those kinds of things. Again, theoretically possible one day we could get there, but, but these are, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, you know. Um, the price history, price momentum, again, looks like the profile of, of past manias as well. Um, we've got whiz kids. That's another thing we had that in the tech bubble where you see articles about, you know, 13 year old kids becoming millionaires, very common thing at the end of one of these types of manias. Um, there's just a huge number of things. There's celebrities, uh, Paris Hilton tweeting about her cryptocurrency investments. I mean, that's not something you see when it's a buy, when it's at six cents, that's usually again towards the end. So um, it's just, uh, it's just aligning up, I guess, the profile of, of the, what the public does and, and how they think about something with past similar uh, investment manias and seeing forming a profile and saying, how does it fit that profile versus another one? Um, and seeing that, that progression as the price moved from six cents again to $20,000 and seeing that, that difference in psychology. Cause it's really interesting too, because it, it the peak tends to be extremely focused and concentrated. Um, with Bitcoin, there was just almost nothing in the news about it until 2013, and it got a lot more headlines. And then it was very quiet until, I think, around six months before the all-time high. And then it was every day was in the news, in the news, in the news. But again, that's also something that, that we look for. So um, I guess that would be the main thing I'd want to emphasize is just looking at that, that profile of, of how people uh, look at things or think about, think about an investment, I should say. So uh, I'm curious to get your opinion. So um, obviously uh, consumer crowd sentiment um, is what it is. Um, one thing we have noticed is um, the general lack of uh, institutional capital that has actually um, been deployed uh, into Bitcoin and or other cryptocurrencies. And what we've been noticing uh, specifically in the last six months is a move towards uh, setting up the infrastructure. Uh, things from, you know, ET, you know, started with futures, but now yeah. we're talking ETFs and, you know, things like that, that are coming through, which if those are enabled, you know, will allow uh, institutional capital to actually take advantage. And the things I put into perspective is, you know, everyone talks about, oh my gosh, you know, this ICO boom, $3 billion raised last year. But if you compare that against uh, what was raised in IPOs last year, I mean, it's still kind of a rounding error uh, on the institutional capital side. Um, right. What is, I mean, it, it appears to me that, uh, I don't know, or let me ask, have you taken that into consideration as you look at your analysis? Because you know, if pension funds literally just diversify and throw, you know, 3% of value or 5% into crypto, you know, I mean, let's put things into perspective, right? You're talking global NASDAQ markets under management is, you know, in the tens of trillions or whatnot. The crypto, entire crypto market is what, two, three hundred billion dollars, uh, give or take right now. So, right. you know, I, I'm curious to get your opinion uh, on that factor. Right. I think what you're referring to is, is often called the cash on the sidelines argument. Like there's a lot of money over here that, that could be invested in this, this asset. Mm -hmm. But 
the issue I guess I have with cash on the sidelines as a, as a method of analysis is just generally that it can apply to, to just about anything. I mean, we could pick a penny stock and, you know, if only the funds put in a certain amount in this penny stock, it would explode or this investment or that. So it kind of can apply to, to just about, just about everything. Um, so I guess I, usually I don't, I don't really look at things using the cash on the sidelines approach, or at least I, you know, it seems to be something that can map to multiple investment assets. I think maybe looking at a reason they might do it is, is another question, I suppose. And I think one issue now, and this is getting into the fundamental, you know, fundamental aspects of blockchain as it is today, but the emperor kind of doesn't have any clothes as far as the fundamental goes right now. And that may change, but as of right now, the, you know, limits in terms of how many Bitcoin transactions can actually occur on the network. Um, it could, it could be a currency for a small town for sure. But in terms of, you know, a nation or an entire world to justify that kind of valuation, it could happen one day, but obviously we'd have to solve a lot of technical problems with, with Bitcoin and probably, I don't even know if it would be blockchain as we know it. And that's one of the reasons I, I got interested in tree chains and that kind of stuff. Cause I think, maybe that'll do it or, or maybe lightning will do something that, you know, I haven't, I haven't anticipated. So I guess there is that aspect of it as well um, that I look at, but that's more the fundamental side. Well, that's an interesting one. So on the fundamental side, you're saying, if I understand correctly, a limiter uh, to the adoption of Bitcoin is the fact that it cannot replace, you know, the U S dollar or the Euro as a currency because it can't handle the transaction volume. Yes, and I would say that is true today. I'm not gonna say that's true even tomorrow because, because it is open source software and ultimately it can be modified as long as the community can come to a consensus. So, and that I am optimistic on. I just don't think it's gonna happen anytime too soon, but I think one day they will solve those problems. Um, so in that sense, I mean, if you're th talking about a crypto becoming the world's currency, we're on the same page on that. I just don't, don't see that happening very soon. I think maybe five years down the road or 10 years, you know, for that kind of adoption. Um, but again, it just depends on what they can do in terms of solving these really, really difficult technical problems with cryptocurrency. Okay. So let's call that the moonshot bet, right? You know, cause if that happens, yeah. a big be worth like, you know, $10 million a coin or something ludicrous. Yeah, that's true. What? If we were to take, let's call it more of a double or a triple bet, um, let's compare sure. Bitcoin against gold. Um, gold is not easily transacted. I don't take my gold bar and cut shavings off it to go buy coffee for gold, right? And if you were to, you know, if one were to make a bet saying, can Bitcoin become a digital gold? Um, you know, the technical limitations don't really matter because gold isn't transported uh you know, a gold, gold is literally not very liquid either, right? Yet it's still worth what it's worth. And additionally, yeah. when gold ETF was introduced, if I don't know if you have enough history to remember, you know, what was, I think it was like 15 years ago in early 2000, yeah. gold ETF blew gold up. And if I look at fundamentals, I mean, what was it? I think it was last week or two weeks back, you know, first the CBOE uh, wrote a letter to the SEC saying, hey, we're now ready for Bitcoin ETFs. And then uh, ProShares, it's been known that ProShares is uh, under review, I believe, uh, in launching uh, some, ET some, you know, ETFs. So how would you look at or how would you consider? I mean, I, I hear the kind of cash on the sidelines when... Right cash can get deployed easily. But what I would ask is, yes, there's cash on the sidelines, but the cash on the sidelines until ETFs and special purpose vehicles and a few other infrastructural things are introduced, that cash can't even play. I mean, if I'm a pension fund, I legally, based on my covenants, cannot invest in Bitcoin today, even if I wanted to, right? Right. I think the way I usually look at those things um, is these are big commitments by institutions. You know, when, the C when they come out and say, okay, we're going to have Bitcoin futures, 
or we're going to have an ETF. It's a legitimization of something. And well, so the, if I look, futures yeah. and ETFs are different though, right? A future doesn't actually hold the asset. An ETF, the ETF actually, you know, I mean, you look at like futures is not going to, can change things, but not as much. I mean, an ETF, I mean, look at what an ETF did to gold. I don't know if you remember uh, what happened to gold after the ETF got introduced, but it was You're pretty talking about GL, GLD in 2002, it was after 2003, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it was early 2000. I mean, my memory isn't, you know. Early 2000. Yeah, yeah that was a like, major low point for gold, 2000, and then it peaked in, in 2011. Um, yeah. But I don't remember exactly when the ETF was introduced. But actually, gold was going to be my, my counterexample for this, too, because gold was actually private ownership, aside from certain newsmatic coins, was actually illegal for U.S. citizens throughout um, much of history. Is after, I guess, after the Great Depression when they banned it. I think a lot of that had to do with the Fed wanting to uh, have more flexibility with the currency that they couldn't have when it was, was linked to gold. And then, of well, course, in the 70s, they completely delinked. But gold was actually re just to clarify, the gold gold got banned because the government needed they needed gold. So what they did was they set a spot price um, in the market, saying all U.S. people need to sell us gold for you know I think it was eighteen bucks a troy ounce, and right. they basically had and resold that on the international market for forty dollars a troy ounce. So that was essentially a money grab. Uh, I can look up the thing. True. This I is. Mean, we're getting a little off, but, but yeah, that's actually another argument in favor of cryptocurrency, which is that it's not easy to confiscate. I mean, unless someone gets a hold of your private keys, but if you're careful with them, then it can't be. But yeah, yeah I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, as far as the institutionalization, I was just going to comment on that because that's usually something, again, we're, we're looking at things with a psychological profile here. And we look at that as, as usually something that comes towards the end of a large trend. So, you know, the institutions aren't going to be there making Bitcoin futures and ETFs when it's six cents or even when it was $12 or when it, when it was, uh, what, $34 or so at that first bubble in 2011. They usually come after it's already been accepted. So when we look in terms of something we actually want to buy for an investment, it's usually better to buy it before the institutions have, have jumped on board. And a great, you know, the historic example of that I was going to use was gold legalization, which after they did that, um, it was right near the tail end of the great, you know, gold bull market in the 70s. And then, of course, gold bottomed, um, um, or sorry, gold started a large bear market. Uh, right after that period. So it's not always the case with you, if you look at history that when an institution approves of something or creates new opportunities for people to invest, you don't necessarily see um, the price increase or investment increase. Sometimes you actually get the opposite. Um, so again, but this is, this is more to our investment philosophy. We look at the psychology uh, behind it more than we look at um, a fundamental possibility for something. So I, I, I'm truly curious um, because, you know, let's talk ETFs. You know, I don't know if you can see my screen, but 2003 gold ETFs came out and then the price of gold went up. Now, obviously it topped out, I think, you know, about five or six years ago. Um, I am curious and I could be wrong, but I am not aware. It seems like whenever some type of an ETF or exchange traded fund has come out, you know, whether it's a spider, right. you know, from the S and P and everything like that, the underlying asset always goes up. Um, is there a scenario that you're aware of? And I would honestly be curious where an ETF has been introduced and the asset has not moved or has actually gone down in value. Well, I mean, I just gave you an example right there talking about gold legalization. I'm not talking about ETFs in particular, but institutional acceptance is, is what I'm talking about. And when that happens and you get a, make it easier for people to invest, for example, um, here, here's another good example. Look at uh, gold as we were nearing the peak in 2011. What did you start to see? You started to see people outside in the streets with signs everywhere. We buy gold. We sell gold. There's a lot of over-the-counter stuff. And you don't see that anymore. 
Um, and you didn't definitely didn't see that in 2001 when gold was at a historic low. No one cared about gold. No one was interested. So oftentimes what we see is people reacting to trends and putting things in places, you know, after a trend has already occurred. But I certainly, I guess I wouldn't agree that there's this, this relationship where you come out with strong fundamentals or create or institutional acceptance at a low, you know, it just, it's not something that, that happens very often. But, you know, we can have this debate for hours. I guess we'd have to each do a statistical study and go through all the historical events, you know, and that kind of thing. No, and it's fine. Again, I'm just, you know, like I said, I took a more bullish position because I actually yeah. do have uh, bearish concerns um, on Bitcoin also that, oh. you know, I haven't brought up or anything on that front. Oh, okay. Just, well, I mean, I like I said, though, I can play both sides because I'm, I'm very bullish in terms of the long term here. So all the fundamental stuff you've talked about, you know, we're we're on the same page as far as that goes. I mean, it's 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 weird because the world's never had like a startup currency before. And it's, it's like owning Bitcoin when it's cheap. It's like, it's like having a bunch of bottle caps and then suddenly someone comes in and says, we're going to now use bottle caps as money. And suddenly you're, you know, you're super rich from something that nobody cared about before. So, you know, there's definitely a huge amount of potential in crypto. Um, but that's again, that I think our disagreement is on time frames. Um, but uh, it's it's actually pretty cool though that you're long term bullish. I think that's definitely the future. I mean, we're going to be going around buying things with our smartphones. Uh, well, so, 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 so this is fascinating. Um, yeah. I'm actually short and or I'm um, short term. I I don't trade on a short term. You know, let me take that back. I might you know. I've got a guy that I've been, you know, got become good friends with that, you know, reads price action all day and looks at Fibonacci's and stuff like that. So I yeah. allocate a small portion of my portfolio. I think we just lost Lawrence, by the way. I, uh, we fine. probably should have let him talk more. Yeah, you know, I, I allocate a small portion of my portfolio to that, but that's more just kicks and grins. Oh, um, sure. So I would say medium term, I'm actually bullish on Bitcoin, but longer term, I'm more bearish. And the reason why I give that is I think Bitcoin has a good medium term future in terms of uh, growing as more as institutional money gets in. But when I look at longer term, I go back to all the upstart companies that have taken on monopolies in the past. And for every upstart, like the percentage success rate of an upstart against an entrenched oh is generally really low. And what I mean by the entrenched monopoly is, you know, the US government, the EU, you know, China. Because yeah. what I see and specifically, you know, US might not be as bad, but like I could see China literally just banning it, shooting everyone that has Bitcoin, confiscating and issuing their new currency. I mean, that could happen. Now, they might not do it right away, but True. you know, Things like that have occurred in all different other industries, you know, whenever upstarts come into play. And if you actually, right. that, you know, usually what happens is the upstart comes in then the monopoly reacts and then monopoly right. takes out number three or number four in the market, takes in all the stuff and then crushes the upstart. You know, look at the internet. AOL is gone, right? You know, I mean, the, the list can go on and That's on, true. you know, on that front. Yeah, and I think it's not in addition to, to entrenched monopolies, there's also sometimes just another startup that's not the first one. Um, I mean, MySpace versus Facebook is probably the best example. So the first mover doesn't necessarily win in the long run. And, mm -hmm. and I guess that is, that is still a long-term concern of mine, certainly for, for crypto. Um, let's see, are you still there? Did we just get disconnected? No, no, no I'm oh, still here. Just lag there for a second. It was, oh. No worries. It was a little slow. Yeah, there have been some new cryptos that have come out that are that are gold backed, and so of course, a lot of people think that that maybe those have more potential because, you know, regardless of technological changes, you still have this old historical form of value behind them with the upshot of being able to transact easily. But of course, the downside is that then they're not truly decentralized. Maybe the transactions are, but you know, someone goes in and knocks on the door and takes the gold out, then 
you, you've just lost everything. And that, to me, that's a huge benefit of, of crypto technology is that you don't really need the backing because money's all, it's money's kind of all in the mind anyway, if you think about it. What's, you know, gold is in a way just as virtual. I mean, I guess you can use it for electronics. I don't know what other usage it has other than being a yeah. great conductor, but. None really. I mean, go outside like, of a belief of value, uh, gold is just as quote unquote right. use as, you know, a Bitcoin. Yeah, that's I mean. true. But, but I do think there are some things, I mean, for me, like the ideal crypto, what it would look like, I think, you know, obviously take Bitcoin great base, but if they can figure out how to, how to build it without using proof of work, so we don't have to use huge amounts of electricity, that as an altcoin would obviously be an improvement because it would lower the transaction fees, lower the whole cost of running the network. Um, it would probably be more scalable. Maybe they'll find a way to solve it with Bitcoin. I don't know. Um, and have full anonymity. I know they've done that with Monero and Zcash and some other altcoins, but you know, there, I guess, you know, Bitcoin isn't perfect. Is it's just some, uh, today it's not perfect, I guess is one thing that I'm aware of. Well, I'm always, kind of on the lookout for, you know, something that would really capture all of those properties in terms of being a really, really good free market money. Cool. Well, hey, we've been on for uh, close to an hour. Uh, I think it's getting time to uh, wrap up. Uh, any final parting thoughts or final words? No, I guess not. It was, it was fun talking to you. We, I th we got a little too much into the bull bear thing, but, but, I don't know. People like that, though. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are conflicted right now in Bitcoin as well. So maybe they'll get something out of that. Cool. Well, uh, thanks a lot again for your time. Uh, we have uh, Elliot Prechter from uh, Elliot Wave. That's the name of the company? Uh, Elliot uh, Wave. That's correct. And uh, you gave us your thoughts on uh, the short term or medium term of Bitcoin. And uh, appreciate your time. So, sure. uh for everyone who's still tuning in, thanks a lot for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys soon again. Talk to you later. All right. Bye -bye. Good to talk to you, Charles. Bye-bye.